this is an everyday sight in New York today. Boeing 107 helicopters operating from the heliport atop the Pan Am building, speeding some 50,000 passengers per month high above traffic choke streets and highways to and from nearby airports. But this is nothing new. Back in 1958, a Boeing 44 helicopter demonstrated the feasibility of such an operation in Houston, Texas. Now it was only a matter of time before the helicopter was developed to the point where it could consistently perform this operation in complete safety with twin engine reliability and instrument flight capability. Man was getting close to achieving his original concept of flight. The vision of flying goes back a long, long ways, back to the time when men first watched the birds and envied them their gift of flight and imagined themselves with the same gift. Possessing the ability to launch themselves into the air, however laboriously. Able to hover and soar over land and sea, free as the wind. Back in the age of Greek mythology, there were those who even envisioned reaching the sun and the stars with disastrous results. And others who felt that the power of flight belonged only to the angels, that it was wicked to dream such dreams. Over 400 years ago, a man put his vision on a piece of paper that exists to this day. Leonardo da Vinci envisioned a mechanical glider propelled by manpower. This is the model of da Vinci's machine. He also envisioned a flying machine that could rise vertically. He designed this machine on the principle of Archimedes' screw, a plane bent spirally around a movable axis and covered with starched linen. The Greeks called this spiral shape a halix, which is the root of the modern word helicopter. Over the ensuing centuries, many men attempted to design and build machines that would enable them to achieve the capability of controlled flight. All of them failed. The one necessary ingredient was lacking, an engine that was light enough yet powerful enough to drive the propulsive mechanism. Man had a great deal to learn about the principles of aerodynamics before earning his wings. For example, he had to learn that planes revolving horizontally do not provide lift, whereas if the planes are tilted, they rise vertically when rotated. If they cannot be rotated fast enough, then they have to be driven through the air in a fixed position, like the wings of a conventional airplane. It was learned, for instance, that air must pass over the curved surface of the wing or rotor to obtain lift. Thus, a low-pressure area is created, causing the aircraft to rise. This is the sort of information that had to be learned the hard way as men continued to strive to achieve their vision of flight. But man is a persistent animal. He doesn't give up easily, and there's always another way to skin a cat. So he kept on trying. Most of these early attempts looked and performed like agricultural machinery. Here is the threshing machine aerial disc harrow, the cement mixer, 1907, the grass cutter, 1922, the flying fertilizer. It actually got off the ground, a little erratic perhaps, but airborne nevertheless. As humorous as these early attempts appear to us today, we should not overlook their importance. It took a lot of courage to persevere while the world laughed, and it finally paid off. It's interesting to note that most of man's early attempts to develop a mechanically propelled flying machine were centered on the use of movable wings, the basic principle of the modern helicopter. By the turn of the century, he had found out that, with the power plants then available, it was easier to obtain lift by driving fixed wings through the air. But that didn't solve the problem of vertical takeoff and landing. And this was his original goal, to be as versatile as the birds. Finally, in 1939, he began to make headway. Here we see the lift imparted by rotating and tilting the rotor blades. The little propeller on the boom is actually an anti-torque rotor to keep our intrepid friend from rotating with the blades, like a whirling dervish. With the anti-torque rotor stationary, the helicopter would rotate like this.
Now, the torque from the whirling blades is being offset by the anti-torque rotor. The helicopter has directional stability. In 1945, this was one of the first successful single rotor helicopters in America, the PV-2. It was the first helicopter ever produced by the company, which eventually became the Bertol division of the Boeing Company. But by placing rotors at each end of the helicopter, with counter-rotating blades, the need for the anti-torque rotor was eliminated. The power needed to turn the anti-torque rotor was now being used to turn the rotor blades that provided lift and thrust. In the event of loss of power, the angle of the rotor blades could be quickly adjusted by the pilot so that the blades continued to spin and a controlled landing could be made. By placing the lifting force at each end of this air-conditioned XHRPX helicopter in 1944, several advantages were gained over the single rotor configuration. The entire power output of the engine could be utilized to generate lift and thrust. Because of the counter-rotating blades, it was no longer necessary to counteract torque with an anti-torque rotor. Also, the center of gravity travel of the tandem rotor helicopter was considerably increased over that of a single rotor aircraft. In other words, it was possible to shift weight to a greater extent without jeopardizing the critical balance of the helicopter in flight. And finally, because of the two rotors, the tandem did not have the tendency to weathercock into the wind. It possessed directional stability regardless of the direction of the wind. The HRP series helicopters were the first successful tandem rotor helicopters to fly and also the largest helicopters at the time. HRP-1s were 10-place single-engine helicopters that operated successfully with both the U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. Coast Guard during the late 40s and early 50s. Then came a more sophisticated tandem rotor design, the HUP, with its synchronized overlapping blades. This helicopter won a Navy production contract in competition with a single rotor helicopter built to identical specifications. Hundreds of them were built in the early 50s for the U.S. Navy and U.S. Army, the Royal Canadian Navy and the French Navy. They were remarkable machines and some of them are still flying today. One Navy Hup even transported 21 flood victims in Mexico, a remarkable achievement for a sixth-place helicopter. Here, the Hup on plane guard duty was Johnny on the spot, quickly hoisting the pilot out of the sea. But aeronautical engineers never stopped thinking big. This was the result, the H-16, the largest helicopter in the world in 1955, with a service ceiling of over 18,000 feet. It could carry 40 troops or seven tons of cargo and unofficially broke the helicopter speed record. But there was no real need at that time for a helicopter of such size. It served a useful purpose, however. It was instrumental in the further development of large tandem rotor helicopters, like the H-21, for instance. Here's a helicopter that did a magnificent job in recent years with military forces around the world. The H-21s patrolled the Dew Line in the Arctic at 45 below zero with the U.S. Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force. It went into combat in North Africa with the French. Later, they were the workhorses in South Vietnam until the larger Chinooks became operational with the U.S. Army's 1st Cavalry Division. It sustained as many as eight hits in a single rotor blade and still returned to fight another day. It swallowed quantities of sand, sweltered in the heat, operated in the jungles, mountains, and rice paddies. This H-21 is on duty with the German Air Force on the North Sea. Military and utility versions of the H-21 helicopter were purchased not only by West Germany, Canada, and France, but also by Sweden. 
commercial versions acted as aerial cranes, transported passengers, and serviced the oil and construction industries. By whatever name the H-21 was called, the Shawnee, the Workhorse, the Flying Banana, it was one of the most versatile aircraft of its day, and that day was only yesterday. Now let's see what our intrepid airman is up to. He's got a friend helping him, but his friend seems to be dragging his feet. Fortunately, each engine in the modern tandem rotor helicopter is geared to both rotors, and one engine automatically goes into high gear should the other fail as a safety measure. And here are the twin turbine tandem rotor helicopters of today. First, the Boeing 107. Military versions are on active duty with the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Marine Corps, the Canadian Army, the Royal Canadian Air Force, the Royal Swedish Air Force, and the Royal Swedish Navy. Utility versions of this same helicopter are in use in Japan and Thailand. This is the 107's big brother, the CH-47A Chinook. The U.S. Army's mainstay in Vietnam when it comes to moving heavy loads, deploying artillery units, and salvaging downed aircraft. It has been one of the major factors in determining victories in Vietnam. Yes, we've come a long way since men first watched the great bird soar and dreamed of flying. We've even begun to approach the maneuverability of the hummingbird and surpassed him in certain respects. Who ever heard of a hummingbird getting its feet wet? A vision four centuries old, now a reality. A reality that actually exceeded the vision. Speeds and altitudes undreamed of in da Vinci's day. Lifting capability and maneuverability that he could scarcely have imagined. Could he have possibly envisioned a flying machine that could land and take off from water? Or fly through the blackest night? And what about the future? The future started yesterday with this Bertol 76 tilt wing back in 1958. The entire wing and both rotor propellers could be tilted, enabling the 76 to take off and land vertically, combining the speed potential of a fixed wing airplane with the versatility of a helicopter. Man never stops dreaming and planning. Here are just a few glimpses of vertical lift concepts. There are many others. After all these centuries, a vision achieved with the help of men of vision at Boeing. <laughs>